Have a good lunch? Fantastic, good to hear that. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for the start of this afternoon session. Uh, I'm very excited to be chairing uh, our next panel, uh, which is all about something that I'm particularly passionate about, othering and belonging, and how we create a society that is inclusive of everybody. Uh, in this session, we'll be discussing race, poverty, and disability. Uh, we have a very good lineup of speakers for you. Uh, how the session will go is our speakers uh, will each make a presentation, uh, and then we'll have a conversation and take questions from the floor. Uh, so our first speaker has flown in all the way uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, he arrived yesterday, not jet lagged. You're doing all right, aren't you, John? Not bad going. Or let me be a much more formal, uh, Professor John A. Powell. Uh, <laughs> so without further ado, will you please put your hands uh, together for Professor Powell? <laughs> audience, I take it. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, and after uh, flying from California, my arms are really tired, but, um, but I'm looking forward to a, a very lively conference and uh, a very lively panel. So the framework I'm talking about is othering and belonging. And at UC Berkeley, I run something called the Huss Institute, and it has uh, seven different clusters looking at marginality. And um, even after looking at seven, it says, and others. So it looks at race, gender, disability, age, religion, um, uh, sexual orientation, and I know I'm leaving some out. And when I got there, I'm the founding director of, that, of the Haas Institute. I thought, what do all of these groups have in common? And we came up with the framework of othering and belonging, that all the groups are experiencing some collective form of being othered, uh, other, being othered uh, and they're all striving to belong in some way. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I want to suggest, though, this is not a US problem. This is actually a global problem. And it's partially precipitated by some global trends, uh, globalization, changing in the economy, uh, but also demographics. I'm going to focus specifically on demographics. So we see uh, the process of othering being expressed partially in terms of right-wing nationalism, ethnic nationalism that's happening all around the world. It takes on different expressions, though. Sometimes it's an expression of race. Sometimes it's an expression of uh, ra uh, religion, uh, language, nationality. And it can take on many other uh, food you eat. So these are all ways in which you can have state-sponsored othering, if you will. And this is a little cartoon. Um, so what is othering? Uh, well. I know, your kind could probably never figure that out. Uh, but the, the, the process of othering happens at many different levels. So it can happen between interpersonal. Uh, it also can happen uh, between football teams. Uh, but we're actually talking about group-based and even state-based othering. Um, so these are just some of the um, lines that can happen around. Now, it's interesting in a way because there's no natural other and there's no natural belonging. And so we, these are all constructed. Uh, even though the mind is ready to other, it, there's no um, automatic content, if you will. Uh, so the content of othering, the process of othering, is social and cultural. So one of the things that's happening in the world that's driving othering um, is the, the movement of people, immigration. And so if you look at all the expressions of uh, um, national ethnic right-wing movements around the world, they actually take on different variation. One thing they almost always deal with is the anxiety about immigration. And um, when things happen, when there's a lot of change, uh, we have a hard time processing it as human beings. So when there's a lot of change, it creates anxiety. So what we're seeing is that, in a sense, the increased diversity around the world is creating a fertile ground for anxiety. Now, that anxiety is normally responded to in one of two ways, and this is uh, Robert Putnam's work, for those of you who know his work. And he did this work originally in the early 90s in Europe. And what he projected then was that as Europe became more diverse across some salient indicator, uh, that it was actually going to have more anxiety. Uh, and the way we normally deal with that anxiety is one of two ways. We either we do bonding, 
which really means closing in or in look, inward looking. We're looking at our own group. Or we do uh, bridging, which means reaching out across to the other group. Now, in fact, what he found is that um, two things, bonding and bridging can happen at the same time. Uh, but also what happens oftentimes is groups actually retreat inside. So there's actually uh, less bridging and less bonding. Uh, so that's actually an oftentimes a response to this growing anxiety around diversity. Now I want to suggest that anxiety itself is not bad. When we, have, when we go through a lot of changes, we oftentimes experience anxiety. That anxiety takes on a particular form though. So think about I have a granddaughter who's seven, so I always use this as an example. So when a little kid gets ready to go to kindergarten in the United States for the first time, it's a, it's a change. And a lot of change produces anxiety. And so you take a little kid like my granddaughter and you say, you know, you're going to do something different. You're no longer going to stay home with your parents. You're going to go to school. Now the kid is feeling a little anxious. It's a change. It's a big change. Uh, and then the parent says, and when you go to school tomorrow, I want you to be careful because there are bullies. And they want to take your lunch money. Uh, and they won't, you know, they're not going to talk to you. They're going to pull your hair. Right? Now the kid is saying, you know what? Actually, I don't need to go to school. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, and, but the other way the parent can talk to the kid is, you know, going to school tomorrow. And you're going to meet new friends. You're going to start learning to read. You're going to learn your alphabet. You're going to have play dates uh, and overnights. Now the kid is like, ooh, 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 can I go right now? Um, so those two forms, uh, it's what I call, uh, this is actually not right, I don't think. OK. What tho those two forms I call bridging, and it shouldn't be bonding, it should be breaking. So, uh, and notice that bridging and breaking is mediated through leadership, narratives, and organization. It's not something that people normally uh, arrive at on their own. So when we see all the kind of polarization that's happening across the world, it's not simply that people are figuring out on their own that they should dislike certain people. Uh, they know that there's some anxiousness. They know that something's going on in their society. Um, and they don't know how to think about it. So the leader, the stories we tell, uh, the cultures that actually tells people whether or not we should be afraid of those people or whether or not we're going to have play dates with those people. Um, and in the United States, Trump has been masterful at saying, those people are a threat to you. And it's a zero-sum game. If they win, you lose. Uh, and he's been very graphic. And actually, I had some language in some of these slides, and I took it out because it was just too vitriolic and violent. Uh, but he talks about Mexicans coming to rape our women. Uh, and a lot of the language, if you look at it, in the UX context and in the UK context, it's not necessarily about the economy. It's not simply saying they're coming to take your job. Um, it's actually some, in some ways saying they're coming to take the, your identity, uh, who you are. And uh, many people have a hard time focusing on identity. They think, they think it's a sort of a squishy thing that doesn't really matter. That what you have matter, but not who you are. We oftentimes think of ourselves much more as human havings rather than human beings. And so when liberals, in the US context, I know liberals mean something different in Europe, uh, hear about othering, they sometimes, we sometimes respond by saming. Uh, what is saming? Saming is basically saying, we're all the same. You know, we may have different religions, we may dress differently, we may have different foods, but we're all the same. It's kind of a, a false assimilation, uh, which actually in some ways, even though it's meant sometimes to be positive, is seen <laughs> as erasing. So when I walk in a room and people in the United States and people say, especially white people say, I, di I didn't even notice that you were black. <laughs> and that's supposed to be a compliment. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to be noticed. In, in, I want you to notice I'm black. I want you to notice I'm tall. I want you to notice I flew over here all by myself. Uh, <laughs> um, but and can you actually have a noticing of differences and make those differences mean something different? Um, 
And so when we look at bridging, bridging is recognizing our differences and then moving to a different place. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. So what we're seeing around the world is uh, this growing diversity. And I know the next, uh, a later panel is going to talk about narratives. And one of the purpose of narratives, one of the purpose of stories, is actually to build identity, to give meaning. Uh, now, we don't normally think of them as stories. So Christians, for example, would be offended if you talked about the creation story as a story. They, they think of it as reality. Uh, but it's important to them. And so every country, every people, if in, in a sense, have an origin story. How do we come to be? Uh, but those stories are always contested. They're never simple. And they're always changing as the world change. Uh, and one of the things that new groups do is they, in some ways, disturb those stories. Uh, so the Christians have their stories. And then here comes Muslims. And they say, well, you know, Jesus was kind of cool, but he could not have been the son of God. So what? You know, uh, so that's sort of disturbing to your story if your story is that Jesus actually is the son of God. So then what do you do with that? Do you bridge or do you break? Um, and one way you bridge is to engage in empathetic listening and empathetic storytelling in an inclusive way around belonging. Um, but when you break, I don't want to hear your suffering. In fact, what I say in a breaking context is my suffering and my story is the only one that really counts. Uh, and so in a sense, breaking uh, is a conversation ending strategy. I don't really want to talk to you. I want you to listen to me, but I don't want to listen to you. Um, and if I listen to you, I'm only listening for the purpose of proving you wrong, not to really empathize with you. So part of the goal then is to think about the circle of human concern. Who deserves concern in society? And I'll come back to this in a little bit. In the United States context, and, you, and we can measure this, so it's not just analytics or conceptual. We can measure who belongs and how much they belong. And what we see is that more and more people are being pushed outside the circle of human concern. Um, and some people are being in the circle, but provisionally. This happens at a sociological level, uh, but it also happens at a mind science level. So one of our impulses when we hear that we categorize people is to say, OK, let's stop categorizing. Uh, and the way the brain is structured, we can't help but categorize. It doesn't mean that the particular categories we use, we have to use, or they have to do the work that we're using them to do. But we're not going to stop categorizing. We can't simply just see people all as individuals. So a lot of our impulses for correcting the pro problem of stereotyping or othering is to say, let's just stop othering. Let's just stop categorizing. Let's just see everybody as people or as the same. Now, this is something from. Uh, Susan Fisk, who's a professor at um, Princeton, and she, along with others, have developed something they call the a stereotype content model. And she's done this in a number of countries, including the UK. Um, and what she's come up with these two axes. One of them is competency, and the other one is warmth. So uh, how much do you like somebody? Uh, do you think the person you like is good for you, going to help you in some way? And do you think they're competent? Um, and it turns out. Virtually, she's looked at several countries now. She sees this model being applied in every country, but the population of the model being different. So in some countries, uh, it's, it's, it's very bad to be uh, poor. Uh, in some countries, it's very bad to be Muslims. Obviously, that's not, not true in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the, co the content, the population of this varies. But the, she has, so you have these four squares. One is paternalistic, which is low status, but not competitive. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk about who's in these in the United States. One is admiration, which is the gold standard, where you think someone is really smart, really competent, and you really like them a lot. That tends to be your tribe. You know, my, my group is just, you know, we're smart, we can dance, uh, we eat good food. Um, and then there's a group that, you know, they're smart, you grant them that they're smart, but you don't particularly like them. You know, you sort of think they're stiff, maybe they're cold. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm not here to insult anyone, but in the United States, 
uh, people from England often fall in this category. <laughs> uh, so these are national um, models. And this is how Amer Americans think you're smart. That's, that's the good news, but they don't, you know. <laughs> and then the fourth group is the group where we think people are not very smart and we don't like them. And what actually shows up, the part of the brain that's associated with disgust shows up when we look at this, uh, these people. And we are sort of structured so that when we see another human being, there's a part of the brain that lights up. We recognize a fellow species. And for this group, it doesn't light up much at all or, and is more likely discussed. Again, who's in this group will vary across populations. Um, but as we look at this group, we see this is the US model. Poor people, homeless people, immigrants, um, drug dealers are, are in this discussed group, uh, uh, ex-offenders. And I've written a paper which basically I said we cannot adopt effective policy for people that we don't see as people. So once we say people are, you know, they're not even human uh, at, a, at a conscious or unconscious level, then you can't adopt effective policy for it. Now here, here's an example. They asked a group of people, for people who are in prison, and the mind, the people, in people's mind is black people in prison, should they uh, be allowed to take um, high school classes and early college classes while they're in prison? And I think something like 80% said no. <coughs> then they asked people from the same pool, but different people, should people in prison be made to take high school classes and college classes? And they said yes. Uh, so it wasn't the, the, the classes. When they, when they thought they were punishing people, they were all for it. Uh, and there are many other examples like this. One other one I want to just quickly share with you. You've probably all seen the uh, philosopher's dilemma of, there's a bus that's about to run into 20 people, and if you push someone on the train, you can save 20 people. If you don't push them on the train, 20 people die, what do you do? Uh, in that test, 80% of people said it's not right to push that person on the train. But here's the, here's the wrinkle. If the person that you're pushing on the train is homeless, then 75% of people say it's OK. Uh, so we value people's lives very differently. Um, and we're going to be hearing about poverty and disability shortly. But in this model in the United States, old people, people with disability uh, in the United States, we actually uh, like them. We feel warm toward them. We just don't think they're very competent. So we pity them. But in pitying them, we actually do it in a prescriptive way. We pity them as long as they stay in their place. If they assert something that's inconsistent with our stereotype, they lose their pity. So their pity comes provisionally. Uh, so you're a pitiful old black man. I understand that must be hard. And then you find out, well, you know, I'm a proud old black man. It's like, well, I don't pity you anymore, and I don't <laughs> like you either. Uh, so our sense of being, our sense of who we are, actually happens across multiple axes. And these are three, but there, there could be others as well. One is economic well-being and being at the London School of Economics. Obviously, many of you think about that in terms of uh, our material wealth. Another is political well-being. You think that in terms of agency. Collective agency is what politics are about. And so we understand that when people don't have a sense of collective agency, they don't feel very good. Uh, but the third is ontological and one, one could even say spiritual. And you can think of in some ways from a sociological perspective that part of the role of religions is to give people a sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, and many liberals, again, in the US context, are um, agnostic at best and more likely atheists. So we have a hard time embracing the idea of religion. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work for us. And many of the people who uh, move to the far right are deeply religious. Uh, and what they're concerned about is grounded in their spirituality, which means they're talking in a different valence than most liberals. Uh, and the right has been much better at engaging this, this area. Now, uh, this slide got washed out. Uh, I'll make these slides available if anyone wants. But one of the things I want to suggest is that what the right has done is taking the process of othering. And othering is a process. It's not simply a thing. Uh, and, I should, um, and as I suggested, uh, the opposite of othering is not saming. And belonging does not mean you don't see the other. It means you're not othering. 
Uh, so othering is a process, and I hope uh, uh, you have time to go more deeply into the othering processes in your country. Um, but othering is used as a strategy by uh, the elites. So you know there are groups coming in, you know people are feeling anxious, and what the elites do is strategically use that to capture government, to restructure government so they can restructure, restructure the economy. So a lot of people who, who actually use the othering process don't necessarily believe it themselves. Uh, so it's not that they necessarily believe, in Trump's case, that Mexicans are going to rape our women, or that they don't like black people, or they don't like immigrants, but they see that it's strategically very powerful. Now, how do I know that? They told us. They've even apologized that they've done it. They say, okay, okay, uh, in the United States, they call it the Southern strategy. It's like, okay, we know we're using blacks to actually aggravate whites so we can win government. Uh, and when they win government, it's not then that they turn and benefit whites. They actually restructure the economy uh, uh, for their own purpose. And again, you see this playing out almost perfectly with Trump. Uh, Trump has almost done nothing to create jobs, to reduce, uh, to reduce inequality. Uh, in fact, what he wants to do is give the largest tax break in 40 years. Uh, that's not what he campaigned on. He campaigned on, uh, I'm going to bring back your jobs. And sometimes people know that. So for example, and you probably heard coal miners if you listen to the United States campaign very much. You know, coal miners need their jobs back. I think some of the count is that there are 18,000 coal mining jobs in the United States, and they're not coming back. They shouldn't come back. And they've asked people, what do you think about those jobs coming back? And they said, we know they're not coming back. But it's symbolically uh, uh, giving them some comfort. So at the extreme, when you put, in a sense, corporations and the elite in the middle of the circle of human concern, people get pushed out, not just immigrants, not just homeless people, not just poor people, but all people. Uh, the whole society then becomes organized just around corporations. And I've written a long piece on this, and I make it clear that I'm not anti-corporate, but I am what I call anti-corporate misalignment, that we misalign corporations so they're no longer serving people, they're just serving themselves. Uh, now, I've been talking about othering a lot in terms of what we do to each other, but a lot of othering takes place in the way we, ha we organize structures in our society. And there are a lot of structures in society, and we organize them uh, in certain ways. So in the United States context, I don't know enough about UK, but we have very segregated uh, geographic areas. Uh, and those areas are not just distributing resources, which they are. They're also distributing identity. So there's certain parts of town that you know are not desirable. And those parts of town not only don't have desirable grocery stores or desirable bus stops or desirable parks, those, those areas have bad air. So they have a bad environment. And implicitly, they have bad people. Uh, so we use structures to actually do a lot of this work. And these are some of the structures. And we've actually done something with this. We, we do something called opportunity mapping, where we map out physical area, the distribution of opportunity, and the distribution of people. And when we say, when we talk about integration, we're not talking simply about uh, putting black people, Latinos, and whites Native Americans and Indians next to each other. We're talking about distributing opportunity so every group has meaningful access to opportunity. And again, not just physical opportunity, but cultural opportunity as well as identity opportunity. Um, this map won't make much sense to you, but it looks at the distribution of opportunity in populations in San Francisco. So what's different about now is how explicit the othering process is that it used to be in the United States you had to engage in what a friend of mine called dog whistle politics. You could make reference to the other, but you had to do it in a coded way so people wouldn't really know what you're talking about. So you talk about those people or people on welfare. Uh, you would never say Mexicans. You would never say Muslims. But now you can be explicit. Uh, and you can be explicit because you have the leadership, you have the elites, you have the public networks given cover for that. And it's, again, it's not just Activate, it's not just activating people's anxiety around the other, it's actually, uh, in a sense, fueling it. It's creating new, uh, new othering processes. Um, and this is just uh, what's happening in Europe and the United States in terms of right-wing populism. It's actually, in recent times, sort of outpacing 
what we might call left-wing populism. So there's definitely populism, but it's authoritarian uh, ethnic nationalism that's on the rise. Um, and this is from a study and, uh, um, by um, uh, these two people, and you can go online and look at it. Uh, and they did the study uh, with the IMF uh, for the economists. And basically what they're saying is that if you look at economic growth uh, over the last several years, it has not correlated with an inclusive society. Uh, the assumption was that as we grew e uh, economically, uh, society would become more inclusive. Now you might say, well, we've grown, but we've grown unequal, more unequal. Even when societies have not grown substantially more equal, we still see a rise of right-wing nationalism, Sweden being a, a great example. Um, and so it's not that the economy is unimportant, but it just doesn't tell the whole story. And again, these are just some of the statements I'm sure you know. Uh, the head of the Philippines, uh, who's um, just could not have made this statement 30 years ago where he's actually, he had his numbers wrong, but anyway, he's arguing that it's okay to kill people. I mean, Germany did it, so why can't the Philippines do it? Uh, you know, so he's, he's celebrating both the othering, and it's not just the labeling of people, then it talks about how you treat people uh, and that it's okay to kill them. And President Trump invites him to the White House because he likes what he's, the way he's talking about. Uh, drug dealers in, in the Philippines. Now, who's a drug dealer is not necessarily people who's dealing drugs. Who's a drug dealer is people who are other. Uh, so anyone can be labeled a drug dealer. So I've talked about uh, bridging and breaking. And demagoguery is a, uh, does not bridge, it actually breaks. Now, I want to suggest that breaking happens in a most pernicious way on the right, but it also happens on the left. Uh, the left also engage, engages in breaking. Uh, we also, oftentimes, because we have suffering, pain, we don't want to hear the suffering and pain of the others, uh, whoever we think of as the others. In the United States context, this would be so when uh, blacks or Native Americans who have real grievances and real suffering, but we have a hard time acknowledging that there might be some white people who are suffering as well. And if you look at the uh, white middle class in the United States is much better off than blacks and Latinos on average and Native Americans, but it actually is suffering. The black or the white middle class is also in decline in al almost along every indicator. And some of you may be surprised that the fastest growing suicide in the United States is among uh, whites from the age of uh, 45 to 54. Um, and there's a whole lot of explanations for that. So it's, it's been a shift away from political uh, moderation, again, on the left and on the right. Um, and so we need to think about turning this around. How do we actually talk about belonging uh, and belonging that's inclusive uh, of all groups? Now, I've been talking a lot about the problem, but I haven't said much about the solution. Um, and let me just say a little bit before I close. Uh, so we have to address our needs at every level, and the needs including being. How do we actually uh, engage with structures, with stories, with narrative, with practices that help people feel like they belong? And we do this uh, through a very deliberate effort. Uh, I talked about sympathetic stories. Um, to hear someone else suffering, to suffer with someone else, to suffer with means compassion. Um, and again, it's not a word we hear much in terms of public discourse but to have compassion for others, even for others that we think of as different, to differentiate. So we acknowledge that they are both different and similar in some positive ways. Um, to also think about a common vision. So what would the country look like uh, if, if it really is a country that's diverse? Uh, now, there's another solution that we often embrace, certainly in the United States. We're celebrating uh, a famous case in the United States, a case of uh, uh, United States versus Loving. And Loving was, in 1967, was a black and white couple that married, and uh, the man was arrested because it was illegal to have uh, marriage between blacks and whites. It's called uh, anti-miscegenation statutes. Um, and whites were concerned that if they allowed blacks and whites to marry, it somehow would change society. We've had that debate recently around gay marriage. 
And it's like, well, if we allow gays to marry, it somehow will change the institution of marriage. So that's the fear that the right wing expressed. The left comes back with, no, it won't. Everything will be exactly the same. That whether we allow gays to marry, whether whites and blacks marry, uh, the institution of marriage and society will be exactly the same. In fact, blacks are just like whites, they're just of a darker skin. Uh, and gays are just like straight, they just like to do their sex differently. Uh, actually, uh, those assurances are all false. It's, it, it's clear that uh, as we have now more interracial marriage, and that it actually is doing some interesting changes. And there was a recent article in the New York Times about how gay marriage is changing sexual practices among straight people. Uh, so when you have large numbers of people coming in uh, without giving privilege to their culture, it actually, culture is always evolving. How do you do it in a way that's, that's uh, inclusive? Uh, so it's not simply, this is my culture. Uh, so I, I came to London years ago, and, and you, you know, your food has improved. Uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but anyway. <laughs> um, so again, Baldwin makes the observation that we're all deeply connected. Um, and uh, so we're deeply interconnected. But the question is, what is the right kind of connections, and how do we get there? Um, and uh, I think this is a, a defining period of time. Given the immigration, there are about almost 300 million people who are living outside their country. That number will go up. This anxiety will continue to be with us. Unless we find a way to deal with it, uh, we will give the right wing uh, a clear path to uh, national supremacy. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, so our next speaker is Baroness Lister of Butterset, uh, a wonderful Labour peer, uh, who is going to be discussing poverty. And then following her is Liz Says from Disability Rights UK. So um, Baroness Lister, over to you. Thank you, and that provides a wonderful framework for what I'm going to say, and I wish I didn't have to follow John, uh, and I'm afraid I don't have any slides because we don't do PowerPoint in the Lords. Um, <laughs> I've called my remarks unequal recognition othering the poor, and unequal recognition through the othering of people in poverty represents an important dimension of what's being called relational inequality, and it speaks to one of the Institute's three research themes. In what ways does inequality matter? It matters not just because of its material impact on individuals, communities, society, the economy, important as that is, but also because of its psychosocial impact on those who bear the heaviest burden of inequality, uh, what have been called the hidden injuries of class. And the deepest injury of class is lack of or misrecognition. Recognition has been described by the political philosopher Charles Taylor as not just a courtesy we owe people, um, it is a vital human need that can only be provided by others. And as leading recognition theorist Axel Honneth notes, a striving for recognition arises from the experience of humiliation or disrespect. And this experience is all too common for people in poverty, especially in a highly unequal society like ours. Before explaining how I've applied the concept of othering to poverty, I'll put it in the context of a relational perspective, and in particular what Robert Walker and colleagues have dubbed the, po the poverty shame nexus. And I'll conclude with some suggestions as to how we might challenge the othering of the poor um, a term I try to avoid, other than in those scare quotes, because it is, it is in its objectifying and homogenizing of people in poverty, it contributes to the othering process. And an understanding of poverty grounded in lived experience brings home how poverty is experienced not just as a disadvantaged and insecure economic condition, but also as a corrosive and shameful uh, relation. A relational perspective draws on psychosocial analysis in an attempt to understand what Fro Frost and Hoggart call the relational wounds suffered by the least powerful. Poverty is experienced in relation to others at both a societal and interpersonal level. 
Um, and as we've heard, those relations are also constituted through other dimensions of inequality, such as race and disability, but also in particular gender. Scientific empirical evidence of the relational nature of poverty comes from Walker and colleagues' cross-national study, which found that, I quote, despite massive differences in material conditions, the psychosocial experience of poverty is very similar and is much shaped by the shaming to which people in poverty are exposed and the stigmatizing and discriminatory practices to which they are frequently subjected. And the ubiquity of the poverty shame nexus supports Amartya Sen's claim that shame and its avoidance lie at poverty's absolutist core. Now, othering is a social process, as John has said, rooted in relationships of power through which the poor are treated as different from and inferior to the rest of society. It's a dualistic process of differentiation and demarcation by which the line is drawn between us and them, between the more and less powerful, and through which social difference is established and maintained. It's not a neutral line, but one imbued with negative value judgments that diminish and construct the poor variously as a source of moral contamination, a threat to be feared, an undeserving economic burden, an object of pity, or even as an exotic species to be explored and dissected. Broadly, othering condemns the poor for what they do or looks down on them for the qualities or capacities they are considered to lack. And this is all too often reflected in how people in poverty are treated by welfare institutions, schools, social security agencies, social services. An account of a recent participatory project involving family members of ATD Fourth World, a human rights organization working with some of the very poorest uh, families, um, observed that the othering dynamic actively constructs families involved in the child protection system as different from us, which dehumanizes and reinforces feelings of shame and worthlessness. The term povertyism is sometimes used to denote how, like racism and sexism, such discriminatory attitudes can become embedded in institutions. Othering thus makes it easier to blame people in poverty for their own and society's problems, so that they themselves become the problem. This fits neatly with the dominant, dominant identification of the root causes of poverty as lying in individual behavior and capacities rather than structural conditions and processes. As Andrew Sayer explains, othering is likely to support and be supported by relations of economic inequality, domination and social exclusion, and indeed to be stimulated as a rationale for these. To the extent that people in poverty's supposed difference is visible, through, for instance, the symbolic signifier of clothing, first identified by Adam Smith uh, as such many years ago, particularly powerful for children in today's consumer society, othering can be experienced in a very bodily way. It also operates as a discursive practice which shapes how the non-poor think and talk about and act towards the poor at both an interpersonal and an institutional level. By and large, the language and labels used to describe people in poverty have been articulated by the more powerful, thereby denying the poor what Imogen Tyler terms representational agency. And it is in his Australian study of poverty, Mark Peel, reflecting on the pejorative terms used by some of our most respectable citizens, concludes that to treat poor people so harshly, you have to see them as unlike you in a very fundamental way. And the pejorative terms vary to some extent between countries, reflecting their different historical roots. A particularly influential label, which Britain imported from the US, has been that of the underclass. It carries echoes of the Victorian residuum, which denoted sewage waste as well as the city poor. It's been described as a discourse of disgust, excess, and waste, which threatens to contaminate the wider society. And in her analysis of disgust and its role in the othering process, Tyler also makes the link via the related abusive term scum with the more recent label of chav. And although not quite co-conterminous with poor and mired in judgments about consumption and taste, the chav label has been stamped with the mark of the underclass. Now, these labels have also been racialized in varying ways. 
Um, in the US, the underclass was explicitly applied to inner city blacks, supposedly mired in welfare dependency, another dominant derogatory label uh, imported to the UK. In the UK, the underclass and more obviously Chav, Tyler argues, propagates categories of contaminated whiteness, which Bev Skeggs has written about so well also. Even if the term white trash has not been imported from the US alongside the underclass. And the process of othering is reinforced and to some extent shaped by political and media discourses. As John Hills puts it, it's skivers against strivers. Families where three generations have never worked against hard-working families. Benefit streets against the rest of the country. Undeserving and deserving, it's them against us. And the reference to Benefit Street is to a programme which has come to symbolise what has been dubbed poverty porn TV, in which the lives of people in poverty are dissected and vilified as popular entertainment. Even more supportive media representations sometimes serve to widen social distance through a process of what I've called sympathetic othering by emphasising difference or evoking pity. Dominant othering representations and discourses don't only influence how the wider society view the poor, they are, of course, seen and heard by people in poverty themselves. Lisa McKenzie observes of the residents of St Anne's Nottingham that they are fully aware that they are looked down on, they are made to feel small, and they are disrespected. The women raged at how they were misrepresented within the media, ridiculed, ridiculed laughed at, and hated. They were also hurt by these representations. And it's not surprising, perhaps, then, that one reaction identified in a number of studies is to try to, pro to, to protect one's own, own identity through a strategy of what Ruth Patrick calls defensive othering, whereby it's deflected onto yet others. This is brought out in a German study in which benefit recipients distanced themselves from fellow recipients portrayed negatively in programmes similar in spirit to Benefit Street. By the same token, there is often a reluctance to own the label poor, which can itself be perceived as stigmatising. Moreover, poor may well not be part of a person's identity. Poverty, after all, represents a socio-economic position rather than a personal defining characteristic. All these factors make it much harder for people in poverty to resist the process of othering by turning into a positive identity in the way that, say, black or disabled activists have been able to. Proud to be poor is not a banner under which many people are willing to march. And this brings me to how the othering of people in poverty might be challenged through the development of counter-narratives. One with particular significance for those who write about poverty, whether academics or in the media, is through recognition of their agency, which challenges their characterization as passive objects, be it lazy, welfare dependents, languishing on benefits, or pitiful victims. Of course, agency is exercised within the structural constraints and opportunities that frame people's lives. Moreover, one of the insights from Walker and colleagues, colleagues' study is that the corrosive effect of shaming on a person's self-worth can itself stunt agency. Nevertheless, study after study is testimony to the agency and hard work involved in the struggle to get by in poverty. And I've suggested a form of other forms of a uh, taxonomy of other forms of agency deployed by people in poverty. ATD Force World's The Roles We Play multimedia project and exhibition is an example of an attempt to challenge stereotypes and to highlight the efforts and validate the achievements of people who experience poverty. Other examples include the Scottish Poverty Alliance's Stick Your Labels campaign, developed with people with direct experience of poverty to challenge the stigmatizing myths around poverty. And in Northern Ireland, a collective storytelling participatory research project has helped to counter shame and create solidarities among low-income participants. Solidarity can also be built through a human rights narrative, deployed more successfully hitherto in the States and in the UK, perhaps reflecting the influence of civil rights struggles. I'm not talking about a legalistic discourse, but one which has at its heart the foundational human rights principle of recognition of and respect for human dignity. 
This speaks to the desire for respect so often expressed by people living in poverty. It also helps to counteract the shame of poverty and strengthen agency. A human rights discourse helps to counter the othering process because it emphasizes what we have in common as human beings rather than what separates us. And here I think I would say, I think staining is an appropriate um, strategy because people in poverty do not want to be seen as different in some way. In the US, I think it's been, uh, it, has, it has made it easier to develop a collective identity with others living in poverty, the first step to, to collective challenging othering and also material inequality. A human rights approach to poverty includes the involvement of people in poverty in decision-making and debates that affect their lives in recognition of the expertise born of experience. And it should inform the ethos of public services delivery to shift them from being shame-inducing to dignity-promoting, to quote Walker and Chase. With regard to Social Security, Scotland is showing the way with its commitment to thread the principles of dignity and respect through its policy-making on Social Security and to listen to people with experience in a very systematic way with people with experience of the benefit system. And one of the key points raised in response to the Scottish consultation on Social Security was the need for improved staff training to help change the overall culture. This applies to other services too. So for example, ATD Fourth World and Royal Holloway's social work training project involve people with experience of poverty in the training to help social workers better to understand what poverty means and the damaging effect on them of disrespectful treatment. Finally, more broadly, I've argued that challenging the othering of people in poverty must draw on a politics of recognition and respect rooted in cultural or symbolic injustice, as well as the more traditional politi politics of redistribution rooted in the struggle against socioeconomic injustice. But whereas a politics of recognition is typically associated with the assertion of group difference, as in, say, black is beautiful, or the assertion of disability or gay pride, in the case of people in poverty, we're talking about a struggle for recognition of and respect for their common humanity and dignity. Unequal recognition, most acute for the othered poor, is both an injury and an engine of inequality. A politics of recognition thus has a vital role to play in challenging inequality itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's a great honour to speak after John and Ruth. I want to just talk about othering specifically in relation to disability and pick up some of the threads that have already been discussed in this session. Um, and I wanted to start with perhaps what is one of the most extreme forms of othering, and that is segregation. And I think in the world of disability that we are kind of living in the shadow of segregation. So, you know, it's not that long ago in the 20th century, certainly in, in uh, Britain, we had over 150,000 people with psychosocial disabilities uh, shut away in institutions. Um, and in the USA, of course, there was segregation within segregation, just to um, reflect on the fact that there are always intersections between these different forms of othering. So for black people uh, with uh, psychiatric disorders, um, people were placed either in separate institutions or in separate wards within those psychiatric institutions. So you were segregated within a segregated system, if you see what I mean. And, and I suppose I'm just thinking, how far have we got away from that? So um, I've put up a picture on the right-hand side of this slide, which just happened, I'm sorry, it's not a very good photograph, but dim. Um, but what it, um, it, it is on the wall of the estate where I personally live in London. And um, this used to be the site of a psychiatric hospital, which was raised to the ground, in my view, very uh, helpfully. Um, uh, but the, you would never know that it had been there, other than there is just this thing that says property of the Metropolitan Asylum Board, which sort of conjures up all kinds of things that may have once gone on there. But whilst a lot of these old institutions have now become gated luxury communities, that kind of thing, mine's not a luxury community, I should say, um, but others are secure psychiatric units, they're still incarcerating people, or they're prisons. And um, there are some worrying trends, I think. So 
In England, compulsory psychiatric detentions have been absolutely rocketing from around 21,000 in 1987 up to 44,000 by 2007. Now it's over 63,000. Black men are disproportionately affected. We're also seeing uh, some clinical commissioning groups and indeed local authorities in this country either implementing or considering implementing refusing independent living support where it's cheaper for somebody with a disability to go into a residential or a nursing home. So what we could be seeing is something of a return of, I'm using the term disabled people, which is our kind of preferred term in the UK, but um, people with disabilities in American terminology, um, going back into those very care homes and institutions that people so, you know, fought so hard to break free from. So I think that's concerning. But if that's a worrying trend, um, we're also living with the impact of the disability rights movement. And um, famously, back in the late 70s, uh, there was a, um, a residential home here for people with physical impairments. And a group of people got so fed up of being expected to be dressed in their pajamas by 5.30 in the afternoon to suit the staff, uh, that they wheeled themselves to the pub in their pajamas and started talking about there has to be a better way than this kind of institutional home. And out of that came the British independent living movement, learning a lot from what was happening in the United States and elsewhere. Um, whereby people employed their own personal assistants, could live where they liked, could li li live a life of the, that was their own life of their own choosing. And um, we then got our first civil rights law. And I think a very important principle um, was actually about not saming. Um, because if, for example, you are a student and you have, let's say, a visual impairment, you need to learn differently with different technology or different tools. If, you have, if you're on the autistic spectrum, you may need different sorts of support in your learning. In other words, you need to be treated differently in order to have a chance of reaching some similar outcomes. And our laws went further than that. They said um, that public authorities should have a positive duty systemically to promote equality. So this was not just about sort of wait for discrimination to happen and then we'll see if there's any redress. It was saying that, you know, if there are, let's say, unequal health outcomes in a particular health authority, you need to analyze that, you need to monitor it, you need to involve disabled people in finding out why, and then you need to have an action plan to do something about it. So I think that's a sort of example of where equality law was not about saming, it was about saying we need to treat people differently. Um, and we had inquiries into whole sectors. We've now got far more disabled people in our mass media. I've just put up a picture of one example, the last leg, which British people here will be familiar with, I'm sure. But, they, but um, basically, it's a satirical, political kind of a program on a Friday night. A couple of the presenters are disabled people, and they, they just interweave stuff about disability politics into the whole program very seamlessly. Very good, very witty, recommend it. Um, but then, so we had these two trends, sort of getting rid of the institutions, independent living, but also um, this, you know, great disability rights movement beginning to take off in the 2000s, really, with seeing some results. Then we had the financial crash, we had austerity policies, and we had reduced eligibility for both social security benefits and social care and other things. Um, recently, this year, um, one of Theresa May's advisors said disability benefits should go to, quotes, really disabled people, not, quotes, anxiety sufferers. This is part of a general rhetoric, actually, about, you know, people with mental health difficulties aren't really disabled, that various other people aren't really disabled. Um, but what's really been happening is that this program of austerity measures has had a well-documented, cumulative, <laughs> highly disproportionate effect on disabled people. Uh, and actually our Equality and Human Rights Commission is doing some more work on that um, disproportionate impact, cumulative impact, as we speak. But just to give an example, since one benefit change, the shift from disability living allowance to personal independence payment a couple of years ago, 50,000 people have lost their motability cars, which are, they're often specially adapted cars, they're cars that are designed to give disabled people independence. This is an absolute, you know, shooting in the foot of um, independent living. Uh, it's clearly turning the clock back. Um, some media 
uh, you know, our wonderful tabloid media, stoke the fear that other people are getting something that they shouldn't. So these kind of headlines like four million scrounging families in Britain, 75% of incapacity claimants are fit to work. So these people aren't really disabled. And again, I mean, as Ruth was saying, disabled people are reading this stuff as well. Uh, and people talk to us a huge amount about feeling that they're under suspicion, that they're, that, you know, they really are living with an impairment, a health condition, but they're, they're, that, that is viewed as suspect, they're not believed, which is really is highly insulting, difficult. Um, and what seems to have been going on is a kind of redefinition of who is really disabled. So in the middle of this circle, you have a group uh, that I've kind of used the word vulnerable, because there's a lot of rhetoric about, you know, of course we're going to look after the really vulnerable people. That's the mark of a civilised society. However, um, this is a relatively circumscribed group, and then outside that group, there's a larger group of undeserving people, those people who, um, you know, they may have anxiety, but they, they uh, don't merit any public um, attention or resources. And... Um, my colleague, um, Evan O'Dell, who credit for this, um, analysed uh, debates in the House of Commons, going right back to the 1970s, of the, on disability, and to look at where is disability discussed alongside discussion of mention of rights, and where alongside mention of vulnerable or vulnerability. And what you can see from this is that in the 90s, Round about the time we were bringing in our civil rights law, there was naturally enough a peak in discussion about disability and rights, and there was another peak around 2005, we had new legislation, more legislation on disability rights. Uh, however, since about 2009, 2008, 9, um, this discussion of rights in, part in the House of Commons has plummeted, well, it's gone down anyway. Meanwhile, discussion of disability and vulnerability has been going up, and the two lines crossed round about 2009. Now, um, we, need to, we need to delve into this data more and, and look at, at you know, the content, but it's a worrying sign. Um, and I think it's worrying for kind of a number of reasons. And, and that's because actually, you don't really want to be viewed as either undeserving or vulnerable. It's a very bad choice. And I think that very understandably, some of us, I mean, I'm coming at this as a sort of an activist, a policy uh, campaigning person, understandably, people have, on, uh, on the campaigning side, have tried to expand, make that vulnerable circle bigger. Because surely, you would, in, in terms of our benefit system, you'd rather be in the support group where you're not subjected to horrible sanctions and you just get your benefits and, at a slightly higher level than if you're seen as an ordinary job seeker. So you, we want to expand that group of people who are in that middle circle. But there are huge risks in doing that. The first risk is that you, by doing that, you're positioning, you're agreeing with this idea that disabled people are vulnerable. Support is all about looking after you. It is exactly what John was saying, I think, about that uh, paternalistic, you know, we're going to pity you, but we're not going to permit you to have any agency or power. Um, it's not about participating in society, it's just about passively <coughs> receiving a service. There's another risk, I think, which is that, this, that in order to qualify as vulnerable, there's a lot of kind of saying, oh, no, no, we're not just anxious. You know, I've got a disease of the brain, let's say, to show how serious this is, what a real, real, tangible, unarguable disability this is. But actually, there's very interesting evidence um, from a number of American and uh, British academics saying that if you say mentally ill people have diseases of the brain, it makes people around them more likely to think they're incapable, more likely to think they're dangerous, more likely to think they have very poor, lack, poor judgment, can't trust them with anything. Like so you're actually kind of depowering and dehumanizing people by the very strategies that people are using to try and secure eligibility to benefits and social care. So I think what we need to do is replace the whole paradigm. Uh, just not accept this vulnerable or undeserving split. And one opportunity at the moment is that the UK uh, is being examined this year by the Committee on the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This, the, the formal examination will happen in August. And I've just put up pictures here. Some of us were in Geneva in March giving evidence to this UN committee. You can see a lot of disabled people showed up in Geneva. And um, pleasingly, we managed to 
decide on a completely united front on what we were saying the big issues were. And I think what this United Nations Convention does is it bridges, to use a, 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 a term being used today, um, it bridges the issues about social, uh, having an adequate income and the, the important issues about social protection and the issues about rights to full participation, education, employment, participation in public life, um, not being in an institution. So it's a positive vision of full participation within which having enough money to live on is one core plank, but it's not the only plank. And um, Disability Rights UK um, is, which I worked for until two weeks ago, incidentally, but anyway, um, uh, still speaking for the bird. Uh, um, so within that kind of framework, we are doing things like working with parliamentarians to secure more flexible apprenticeships, so more disabled people can get into apprenticeships. Um, we're talking about rights to work, not, not only rights to be on benefits, it's got to be both and. But on benefits, I mean, just recently, for example, we influenced government to change regulations so that there couldn't be a shift for young disabled people to a loss, or a potential loss for some young disabled people of 55% of their income, which was just utterly shocking and hidden in the small print. So we do that sort of stuff. Um, what, within our kind of diaspora, so this is a, a, a man with a learning disability or intellectual impairment called Gary Borle, um, who's been a real pioneer. And he said, we want greater powers to be seen, to vote, to be included, to have the same opportunities in social life, education, employment as everyone else. And one of the things we're trying to do is bring people together across very different experiences of disability. We were delighted at our last AGM that a whole group of people with dementia turned up and started demanding rights not to, you know, they say all the money's going into research to cure dementia. What about our human rights to live a decent life, to be accepted, not to be thrown out of the workplace, and so on and so on. I mean, really uh, great stuff. Um, so I think um, what I'm really arguing for is that we want um, a right to participate equally. It's not about help for poor, vulnerable people, nor is it about disabled superheroes. We, we have very strong Paralympic tradition in this country, uh, and that can be used to imply, well, everyone can achieve anything by their own efforts if they really try. Well, that's not the message either. What we want, I mean, agreeing with Ruth on shared humanity but and respecting and understanding all our differences. Mm -hmm. And it's about investment in everybody's participation, which actually will benefit everyone. We've done, um, at Disability Rights UK, we run a leadership program run by and for disabled people. And um, people are kind of saying, do you know, I can draw on my experience of disability in terms of the problem solving, the resilience, um, the empathy and so on that I've developed. If I use it well, this can be an asset. It's not all deficits, it's not all negative. I mean, you know, some of, some of it's challenging. I'm not saying it's all positive, but... Um, so I think it, this is about, this is about um, really enabling people to participate fully in our society and in our economy. And I was very taken with um, one of John's phrases, um, something I saw online, saying there is no other. And if we could get to that point, but I think it is about really recognising and supporting everybody's participation. And I'd just finish on saying that... Um, it's really good to be here at this event today. Disability is clearly profoundly linked to inequality. I noticed that JRF um, put out uh, data on poverty suggesting that half of households in this country living in poverty have at least one member who's living with disability. So disability and poverty are very, very, very interlinked. And I think the more bridges that we can build, both between sort of the academy and the activists, and just from my point of view, between disability and these wider agendas about inequalities, which have been, I've been really enjoying listening to today, uh, the better. So we don't want to just plough our own furrow in, this, in, in the world of disability. We want to link up and really make a difference together. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, some fantastic presentations there and some really thought-provoking uh, comments. Um, I'm going to start and just ask you each question, um, and then I think let's open it up to the floor and have a conversation, because uh, there's so much to cover. 
Um, so I'll start with you first, John. Um, what I wanted to know is, what can we all do to help influence the circle of concern in terms of widening who's included in it? Well, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I just it's a delight to be on this panel. Mm. Um, can I introduce, um, and no offense to any uh, posh white men, we are otherizing you on this panel, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> that's life. <laughs> John. Um, so um, one thing is that I think um, both Ruth and Liz sort of suggested sort of language and policy. And it's complicated because um, as, as Liz suggested, some of the strategies to win benefits actually uh, end up uh, further otherizing people. Mm. And the language itself, we're, we're struggling with the, United, the, work, the language in the United States around disability. The language itself is problematic um, because in a sense, structures always normalize some group at the, at the uh, cost of another group. There are no free structures. Uh, and so part of it is to have, again, uh, what both Ruth and um, um, Liz talked about was having clear goals, right? Uh, that is, um, instead of just removing discrimination, saying we want some outcomes, and I actually written about that in the context of targeted universalism, saying that the universal goals, the goals is not to simply have what you have, but they're goals that everyone should have. And to give you just a very clear example, the example I oftentimes use is that we build an escalator to get people to the third floor. Mm. And then here comes some, someone in a wheelchair, um, and it looks like that person is the problem. Uh, and we might say, let's put him or her on the wheelchair, and they fall or they're clumsy, uh, and they become the problem. The structure has actually uh, normalized against people who are ambulatory. Um, and there's sort of structures always already built in bias, and then it makes us actually notice certain people. Now you may say, well, uh, well the person is disabled, but not necessarily. It's only disabled or um, marginalized by the structure itself. And this may seem like an a insipid example, uh, but I'm, I'm taller than most of you. Uh, and uh, if you could see the top of my head, you would notice I have um, a bruise on the top of my head. Uh, when I went to The Ohio State University, uh, they had a rule that if you're going to do anything on company business, mm. even if you're using your own money and you want to rent a car, you had to rent a subcompact. It was a universal rule. We're treating everyone the same. And I said, you know, I'm 6'4". I'm not riding in a subcompact. <laughs> and, and, and they said, Professor Powell, this is the rule that everybody follows. Uh, and I had to go see the dean of, who was uh, the dean of all things unimportant. Uh, <laughs> and it went all the way to the chancellor. The chancellor didn't change the rule. The chancellor gave me special dispensation. Uh, and so, in a sense, I was stigmatized. And then when I rode around in my big car, all the everyone said, Professor Powell thinks he's cool. Look at him in this big car. Oh, big car. <laughs> it didn't cause us to look at the structures. Mm. Uh, and, and I became marked. And so part of it is to sort of think about the work the structures are doing. Yeah. Uh, so you could say, in a short world, I'm certainly disabled. Uh, but I don't think of myself as disabled. I think of, you know, so there's a lot of circumstances in which we label people. Uh, and then they become the problem, rather than saying, let's make society so that everyone belongs. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, which I haven't touched on, is we all have multiple identities. And those identities are situational and shifting. So there's some places where I'm leaving here and going to France, and my French is very bad. Um, and so I will be at a serious disadvantage in France. Uh, when I go to England, I'm still at a disadvantage because I speak English differently than most of you. But anyway, the point is, is that certain situations enhance our, our attributes and others don't. But how do we make sure that everyone has a, the resources they need to fully belong? Yeah, I get it. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Ruth, um, I wanted to ask, obviously, um, globalization we've seen over the past sort of 30 years, a real rise in income inequality, so therefore a sort of heightened otherizing of the poor. What do you think it is about our societies, particularly Western societies, that is okay with that, that is sort of comfortable with that? Um, well, I'm not sure I'd, I'd necessarily 
put it all down to globalization, but it's certainly been, whatever the underlying structural trends, have certainly been aggravated by government policy in this country. And I mean, there are probably some people here who are too young to remember the 1980s, but that was when we went from a not that, I mean, you know, we weren't equal, mm. but when you look back at the 1970s and on other dimensions, of course, on the, around gender, disability, race, and so we were much more unequal, yeah, yeah. but in terms of socioeconomic um, inequality, I mean, we, we just went into a completely different kind of society after the 1980s. And it's just been impossible to kind of get back, really. I mean, it's been such a, and some of the work done here shows how it then reinforces each other. Inequality of income then reinforces inequality of wealth, which reinforces inequality of income. I mean, there are times when I do think, yes, it's just become normalized. That's how it is, because a lot of people actually don't know anything different. Um, and there is, People assume, you know, actually, sometimes colleagues, people feel they have to say that inequality is getting worse now in order to be able to say something serious about inequality, when actually, other than, you know, one very particular measure, it isn't. And then I see colleagues in the Lords just being kind of swatted down, because they say, you know, they say, well, you know, the figures don't show that inequality, as if somehow that makes it all right. Because, you know, where we are is such so bad that it doesn't have to be getting worse for us to have to yeah, protest about it. Yeah. So, but, and it's, it has become, you know, in some ways it's become normalized through the kind of processes we've been talking about in terms of, you know, if you say, if you, if you process of othering, that it's, the, you know, the people who are at the sharp end of it, there is their responsibility, their failure, yeah. that they're not doing well. And of course it's these wonderful, you know, dynamic captains of industry or ever, you know, who deserve what they're getting at the top. And then some people at least will say, well, at least, you know, we should, if, if people, you know, haven't earned it so much, then perhaps we should consider it as if anyone, anyone deserves the kind of rewards that some people are getting, however good they are, however su successful they are, no one in my view deserves some of those rewards. So it's partly, I think, a kind of moral question as to why, you know, that people, that we have such disparities. And, and uh, although at one level I think it is kind of normalized, all the, 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 the surveys show that people don't think inequality is a good thing, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily follow that they will then support redistribution. We were talking about, someone was talking yeah. about this this morning, because, the, you know, people don't, the, the state in a sense has been, kind of has lost in some ways credibility as an engine to do something about it but what we've been seeing i think what you were talking about john and 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 what was being talked about a bit this morning that to some extent even if it's not vocalized in this way i think what we've been seeing politically is partly a response no question, yeah. to this massive inequality and, and the, 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 the way people are being treated as part of it. So the challenge is how to ensure that it's not the Trumps of this world who then can exploit that. And as you said, you know, they're not doing, I mean, they're going to make it more it unequal, worse, yeah. but they've spoken, they've showed, they recognize what's happened. They've spoken to people who feel mm. they're not being heard. Mm. So it's how can more progressive forces do that with an agenda that actually is going to do something about inequality. And, 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 and again, we've shown this morning that such high levels of inequality are not inevitable in a globalized world. They're not, they're at not, all. at all. And do you think that also, because of what's happening politically, we no longer have the luxury of ignorance in that we will have to wake up to the suffering that's happening around us? Well, I mean, some, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, some people, I think, will, some people will see what they want to see. Mm. Um, you know, we, you know, the whole thing of sort of confirmation bias, you know, that you, you but I think some people have, uh, and by and large, I mean, the, the, the media, although there's a lot more perhaps about poverty and inequality now than there has been, so much of it has been damaging this kind of, you know, it's been done, as I said, poverty porn, that it's harmful more than, 
So, I mean, yes, but I've, I fear that many people will remain either in ignorant, I, I willful ignorance in a sense. I mean, many politicians will they'll talk about, oh, yes, you know, we, 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 we want a fair society and so forth. But do they really, are they really prepared to look at, at the kind of, some of what's happening right at the very bottom or challenge what is happening yeah, at the very, very top. top. Yeah, brilliant. So, uh, Liz, brilliant uh, uh, presentation there. What I wanted to ask you is where people with disabilities are concerned, in our country, I would say they're probably one of the most underutilized groups mm. in society. And we all seem completely comfortable with not even creating a space for them to be able to contribute. So how do we move the conversation from benefits and social care, which we understand, of course, is necessary, but also to contribution, creating a skills audit to see where in our economy we can integrate them into better? Um, yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, one thing I would really like to see is much more attention given to good, inclusive education. Yes. Um, and... Unfortunately, um, when we did our report for the UN, um, the, the statistics show that the proportion of disabled children going to state mainstream funded schools yeah. is going down and the proportion going to separate special schools is going up. Um, and I think this is bad both, I mean, I'm not saying that some of those special schools don't do good education, but, but the separation is bad for all sides, Probably. I think. Yeah. So, I think one thing is to, um, I do think that there is a lot to be said for, you know, early years and childhood, and then in, uh, which can lead into, potentially into inclusion in employment as well, that that, should, that starts to change, if it's done well, it starts to change attitudes of yeah. non-disabled people. But I think the other thing at the moment is that the way that um, social security changes have happened is that they've brought in a lot of fear amongst disabled people. Mm. So, which I don't think is the, if you're afraid that, you know, if you don't comply with this, this and this in the regime of the, the, what you're being asked to do by Job Centre Plus, if you don't comply, you will be sanctioned potentially. You will lose benefit, you'll lose part of your benefit, you'll, you know, um, and you're already living in poverty mm. and you're already struggling. Then actually it, it doesn't put people in the right frame of mind yeah. to try something. Yeah. So it seems to me that it's not surprising then that people are just trying to cling on to the benefits and almost can't get, haven't got the mental Move space that, to yeah. think. I think, you know, I, I just don't believe there's any evidence that suggests that that kind of quite harsh conditionality uh, is effective yeah. in supporting to say, people to move from out being out of work to work, something that provides some basic financial security and then a lot of encouragement and peer support and, yeah. and uh, you know, good access to employment, ex work experience and so and on. working with work. the private sector to Absolutely. make sure they also yes. prepare for this. Exactly. And there are some private sector organisations, I have to say, who are really good at this stuff and there are some who are really yes. bad at it. <laughs> Okay, so any questions? Oh, lots of questions. <laughs> uh, gentleman over there in the jacket. Hi, my and name is Apu. I'm here as, as an well. Atlantic Fellow. So my question is to uh, Professor John. So you discussed about the circle of concern. So my, the two part to my question, the first question is, do you think uh, the narrowing of circle of concern is a direct uh, product of uh, the neoliberal policies, which has been practiced uh, since the uh, 80s? And secondly, <laughs> The othering process that you see today uh, is also taking place in uh, places where uh, the neoliberal model itself was called on the question. So be it uh, US where uh, there was an occupying Wall Street <coughs> or, uh, <coughs> or in India where uh, there was an anti-corruption plank in which the new right-wing Hindutva government came to power in 2014. <coughs> so do you think, and this is also like, the proponents of the neoliberal policies are also the corporations. So do you see any kind of uh, link between the corporations and the othering process? Because they also control uh, the, the mass communication and the mass media. So is it a defensive mechanism that we are seeing today where uh, you're picking the soft targets like a uh, Mexican immigrant or a uh, uh, minority in, 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 in India? 
Well, thanks for the question. So yes, I, the, the, one of the slides I had where I talked about uh, the elites have used the othering to actually capture government. Uh, and they've done it in an interesting way because they start off by actually discrediting government. And so uh, certainly in the United States, many liberals are, are uh, skeptical about government. And with the decline of the trade unions, it means there's no counterbalance institution uh, that we can use to actually structure this distribution of uh, rights and, and benefits in society. And if you look at the United States from the 1970s on, the laws have been much more in favor of corporations. Um, and, uh, and you'll see more of that. And you certainly see that under Trump. So, um, so I do think, I mean, we've, we're talking about some complex things, but I think that corporations and the elites have been using othering strategically. Uh, and so when they see a group uh, and large-scale othering and anxiety among the larger population because one of the things we haven't said is that the othering and belonging process or how I constitute myself is related to how you're constituted. Yeah. Uh, so in the U.S. context, what that means historically is that whites have constituted themselves uh, to being dominant over blacks. That's part of white identity. Not white people, not individuals, but that's part of white identity. So when schools were integrated in the United States in the 1950s, they actually were not integrated. But when, when the idea of integration came, whites were very concerned about being polluted and losing their white identity. Not losing necessarily their job, losing their white identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the elites were able to turn that into, um, it's just it's very insidious. Uh, because the elites were not necessarily principal racists. They were strategic racists. Um, and I think you see similar things happening in India. I think it's, uh, and so you have this odd coalition between um, right-wing cultural conservatives and the elites, oftentimes making strange bedfellows. Um, and so I think we have to look at it at, at both levels. Um, and I think to me, the, the operative thing about belonging is you get to actually make the rules and make meaning. Mm. You get to make, so you don't have to sort of just integrate into some pre-existing structure that you had no role in making, that you actually get to reconstitute the structure that is inclusive. Um, and um, you know, I think it's a, a very important process. Uh, but I, I forget which one of you talked about strategic othering or defensive othering, defensive, defensive yeah. othering, that it's not just top down, we do it to each other. Mm. Uh, so in the United States, there's very complicated relationships between blacks, Latinos, within the black community itself, who's really black, who really belongs, who really has agency and voice. Um, and we haven't developed an effective counter narrative. No. We haven't talked about something that really, uh, that really values. So we haven't, we haven't done that. We, so the circle of human concern uh, is too easy to, to elicit allies who says, I'll just give you one quick example. My uncle, older than I am, when he went into the military, he came back and he said, you know, they treat blacks so badly in the military. They act like we're dumb, they act like we're stupid. It just really pisses me off. And he said, but you know, they treat Latinos badly too, but they really are dumb. <laughs> uh, and, and he didn't see the irony of what he was saying. Uh, and so it's not just top down, it's, it's, it's bilateral as well. A man in the green over there was next, and then lady after. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I come from the Atlantic Philanthropies Program in South Africa. The organization is called Tecano. I wanted to know from the speakers whether, when I looked, heard what you were speaking about, the analysis of criminality and that as how that increasingly be, being, is being used. So for example, in South Africa, if you were black, you were a criminal. Mm. You know, you, the, 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 the moment you were born black, you were already a criminal. So wherever you walked, wherever you lived. And then even with poverty, so poor people who try to make a living for themselves, try to trade on the street, try to build their homes in places where they supposedly not supposed to be building their homes, they're seen as criminal. So the notion of criminalizing poverty or criminalizing black people. And I'm saying that the situation has gotten so bad that when it comes to dis dis disabled people or in social security, the first thing that in the popular media it's all about is okay. they're trying to scam the system. Yeah. These people are criminals. So I was thinking that in your analytical framework, you didn't go that far, but I would go that far yeah. as saying that this othering 
and the way in which we have criminalized others, and, and states use that. So you never find a rich country going to war with another rich country. They're always bombing a poorer country than themselves. So I thought that was an, imp an important analytical framework. You want to start, and then we'll go down. I think you should all answer that one. Liz, do you want to go um, first? Yes. I, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the trends here has been towards more kind of um, prevent, it, it sort of, um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't get the terminology right, but, um, but essentially kind of um, intervening to, uh, to treat people as potentially criminal when they haven't yet done anything. Um, and in the con it happens in a number of ways. Started with things like antisocial behaviour orders, you know, and and it can yeah. people can easily be penalised without having to go through proper due process, etc. Um, and those sorts of measures are disproportionately used on poor people, on people from different black minority ethnic communities, and so on. But um, in context of disability, the other thing that happens is that, particularly, I think, in the mental health system, if you if you have ever, for example, been aggressive, perhaps on a hospital ward or something, that goes on your notes. That means then that you're not considered eligible for particular kinds of housing. You're, there are risk assessments done. They follow you around potentially forever. You have no way of, you, have, you don't have your day in court. You can't say, hang on a minute, I wasn't aggressive. I was actually reacting against what somebody, you know, you, you don't have the chance to do that. You can't wipe the slate clean. So I think... I think you're right. I mean, I think this is about power and who gets defined as um, perpetrators of various things or a risk to society. Yeah. Quite topical, obviously, with the, the whole terrorism debate as well. Yeah. Ruth? Uh, I think that's a really helpful point. Thank you. I mean, just, I'll just make two points. One is, I mean, yes, the link between poverty and crime, but what is rarely seen is actually people in poverty are more likely to be subjected to crime. Yeah. Um, and when we're talking about um, crimes of property, are much less likely to be insured, and so actually the crime has a much greater impact on them. And then also the ways that the rules of the system can criminalise people in poverty, and I think it's partly perhaps what you were getting at in terms of um, informal work, you know, social security rules that you know, people have been criminalised because they're working on the side or whatever. Um, and there's been you know, research done, uh, Community Links, I think it was, a few years ago, showed very clearly there's a lot of um, uh, the sort of working on the so-called um, uh, uh, fiddling the system. Mm. It's not about, it was about need, not greed, yeah. which is what they called, called it. And, um, and actually sometimes it's that the system itself makes it so difficult that it's easier just to kind of do it rather than tell the authorities because then you have to go through all the hoops and everything. I mean, it might get a bit better with universal credit, but um, so, so yes, there is a, a process of criminalization that going on and then that for some, in some area places, the only way to get by is through you know, non-lawful means, because otherwise, and, and actually, I've suggested also, that that is an example of agency, you know, that is not people, you know, just, just waiting for things to happen, that's people doing it for themselves. Just to add very quickly, um, a, a friend and colleague of mine, um, Michelle Alexander, wrote a book in the United States called um, uh, Mass, Inca Mass Incarceration as the New Jim Crow. Um, Francis Fox Piven, uh, Piven and Cloud wrote a book in the 60s called Regulating the Poor. And they, um, and then, sorry to give you all these titles, but Hardcore wrote a book called The Illusion of a Free Market. And in it, he argues that as markets are apparently free, which they never are, uh, free market really means they're structured for uh, the elites and not for people. But he, actually, he argued that as you move to free markets where you don't regulate the market in behalf of people, you end up regulating people in behalf of market. Um, and I think Muhammad's deeper point, which I completely agree with it, is that you're actually criminalizing people, their whole being. And so you have to, so basically, how do you regulate uh, black people who are not real people um, in a society that's organized for white people? And so a dominant way was through segregation, right? You create laws of segregation to contain blacks in neighborhoods, and if they deviated from those neighborhoods, then they were 
suspected of a crime. In South Africa, apartheid system. The apartheid system was a legal system. If you violated that system, you were committing a crime. But your real crime was being black. Your real crime was being an other in society making claims on humanity, even before you did anything. Because if you look, and I know we're out of time, but if you look at South Africa, the United States, or any country, India, you regulated and criminalized the behavior, the food, the customs of certain people beforehand. Uh, and I'll just give you one quick example, and then I'll stop. It's, um, there's, uh, in the United States, um, the United States had a thing that Native Americans had to stay on the reservations during a certain period of time. Uh, and what the United States did, and this was custard, some of you may have heard of custard, uh, they found gold in the Dakota Hills. Uh, and custard was actually there to protect, the United States Army was supposed to protect Native Americans from poachers, from whites coming in. But they found gold, so what they did is they cut off the food supply to the Native Americans. So the Native Americans left the reservation to try to get food. And when they were far, far enough out from the reservation, they gave them a few days to get back, knowing they could not get back. And when they couldn't get back, then they said, because you're breaking the law, we can now attack you. And that's, I mean, most Americans don't know that history. So the law just becomes an instrument of the elites to regulate the poor. And they pass, after, the, after slavery, blacks were in urban areas trying to find jobs. The United States passed the law against laudering. So if they could go into cities and say, you don't have a job, you're breaking the law. And then they arrested them and sent them back to the plantation. So slavery did not end in the United States until 1945. So the law becomes a tool of the elites. And so part of being society is that the law and the making of the law have to be responsive to all the people. Yeah. And on that note, uh, what a fantastic panel. Can we have a round of applause? For <laughs> 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 <laughs>